reporting on the games you love by people who love to game. The MMO Reporter Network. MMO Reporter's coverage of PAX East 2012 is brought to you by our exclusive sponsor, Squarespace. And I'm here at the Tor booth with James Olin. Uh, we're going to talk about, of course, none other than Tor. We are now a few months out from launch. Patch 1.2 is coming up. Um, must be pretty satisfying to see the, uh, the positive success that's coming out of the launch of Star Wars The Old Republic. Oh, yeah, it's really exciting. Um, the fan response has, has been great. Um, people are having a lot of fun. Um, we've had the success that we wanted to see, um, and uh, we have the full. The whole team is right now working on you know, providing new content throughout the year. We have a lot of fun stuff and a lot of cool stuff coming out. Obviously, with um, update two, which I think is probably one of the bigger updates you'll have ever seen in, in MMO history. It's it's huge. Um, we have that, and then in a few months after that, we have update three, and then update four, and we have a whole bunch of updates planned for 2012 and more stuff in 2013. Awesome. Awesome, very exciting. So uh, we're now two, uh, two updates in since launch, two big updates, obviously, other than the small uh, patches. Um, what's the driving force for BioWare uh, with getting these updates out so quickly? Um, well, I think it's our philosophy that you know, we're a massive multiplayer game, people are paying a subscription, and you know, it's a service, and they expect um, something out of that service. And so we want to reward them with a lot of high quality content and a lot of high quality systems and to continue to expand the universe. Um, because you know as a as an online game, we're not, you know, uh, we weren't finished when we launched, we were just started. You know, we we and just as, as a team we're really excited about continuing to expand the Star Wars universe because it's so big and there's so many things we can add to the universe. It's um, it's pretty fun to work in actually. Uh, so we've got a new PvP war zone that's coming out uh, with uh, patch 1.2. Can you give us a little bit of information about that? So that happens on the world of Genova, and we wanted to go with a kind of a different flavor um, with that. We were inspired by, um, you could say, the uh, storming of Normandy beaches, D-Day. That's kind of the inspiration for it, except in Star Wars universe with blasters and lightsabers. Awesome. So um, it does take uh, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, control point mechanic that Alderaan has, but it kind of turns it on its ear a little bit uh, by requiring players to have two control points before anything happens to the, the score of the other player, before their numbers start going down. Um, what were you thinking about with requiring the two instead of just the one like you've got for Alderaan? Well, we want to always put some gameplay differences in any of our war zones. If it was identical to the, um, you know, the gameplay mechanics in Alderaan, I don't think players would have reacted to that as well as having some differences to make it a little bit more unique. So when it pops, they get a different experience. Uh, we've got also some changes coming up um, uh, to the, the, the moddable gear uh, as well, correct? So what, what's happening with, with moddable gear and, and endgame uh, uh, gear? Well, one of the philosophies we have is we want players to be able to look they w the way they want to look, in, especially at the highest level. So if you want, if you have a certain set of armor that you want to wear um, when you're doing your operations or when you're doing PvP, uh, we want to allow players to do that. It's going to be more difficult, um, but at the same time, it will be something that's possible. So why did you choose to go with a, a moddable gear system uh, rather than, well, let me rephrase that. Are you choosing to go down the path of the moddable gear for how players look, or will you think at some point in the future of adding a full cosmetic outfit system? No, I think we're going to go with the moddable gear. We like to make it more, um, yeah, we had that choice early on, and, and we went down the path of the moddable gear, because it is more of kind of a gameplay thing, and it's kind of fun, and it also fits the, the Star Wars themes, you know, people being able to you know, change their armor or, or customize their stuff. If you think about Han Solo, he's always um, customizing the Millennium Falcon, so it's... It is something that happens in the Star Wars universe, or Boba Fett's always customizing his armor. Uh, we've also got um, uh, some some changes coming up to, to crafting in 1.2 as well, right? Can you can you give us a quick overview of those? So that's based a lot on feedback that we were getting um, uh, in the early months. Basically, people were feeling that the crafting, uh, that a lot of the um, the crew skills, crafting skills, um, were really good throughout the level up game. But once you got to the you know the highest levels. Um, a lot of them weren't as useful, so we did a balance. But we did a lot of changes and adjustments to make sure that all of the um, the crew skills are useful at the at the highest levels of the game. 
So what are you looking for, most forward to uh, when you go into game when patch 1.2 launches? I know you've played it uh, obviously with the tests, but when it launches, what's the first thing that you're going to want to do in game? Probably create, um, like uh, the legacy system is, is kind of the centerpiece of uh, game update too, so I'm probably going to want to roll up a new character and uh, just start playing using uh, the new legacy system. That's the thing that excites me the most. So speaking of the legacy system, uh, can you give for maybe some of uh, our listeners who maybe don't play the Old Republic, because uh, we've got listeners and, and video watchers who play a whole bunch of different MMOs, what is it about the legacy system that makes it so different than any system we've seen in other MMOs? Well, the legacy system is about creating a family um, within your MMO. So uh, in any other RPG or MMO, you, you, know, you create a character, you might create multiple characters, but they don't really have any relation to each other. So in Star Wars The Old Republic, when you create um, new characters, they can now be related to your, um, to your other characters, you know, as siblings or parents or children or friends, and you can create this big family tree. And that's really exciting, especially in the Star Wars universe where you know, it has one of the most um, famous family relationships in cinema with Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. So you can create your own um, family stories within the game. I think that really appeals to, to our fans. It appeals to me, for sure. So we've got uh, a whole bunch of different systems that come along with that, uh, with the race set unlocks, the special unlocks, the special abilities. Uh, with the abilities, why did you choose to uh, to lock some of them behind a, a cooldown with the, the uh, I forget the exact name of it, is it the heroic ability cooldown? What what was the the, the thought process behind that decision? Well, that was more of a balance, um, a balancing issue. We want to make sure that um, while the legacy system is going to enable you to do things you couldn't normally do um, if you weren't a part of the legacy system or you weren't using it, we didn't want to get it to the point where you know a player who has all eight um, you know, characters at level 50 and has all the legacy abilities is so much more powerful than, than another player that um, you know, it's, it's completely unbalanced. So that was very much um, a balancing issue. And with the unlocks that you can get for your ship, um, framing it around the idea that MMOs for, for many years now have always tried to have a central hub, a, a town. With uh, WoW, with every expansion that came out, there was always a town that they wanted the players to go to uh, so that there would be more uh, social interaction. With the ship unlocks and all the amenities that you can get on your ship, how are you going to combat the thought that maybe players will just stay on their ship, never go to fleet, and lose that, that community interaction? Well, we're always taking, the one thing we, we um, are able to do is we're able to see where players are in the game. So if we're seeing that um, you know, players are not going to the, the fleet hub or whatever hub we have in the future, um, yeah, we can make adjustments there to encourage them to go there. There's other reasons to, um, to go to social hubs other than just what currently exists, like the, um, uh, the Galactic Trade Network and the fact that you want to you know, use chat to find groups to do operations and all that. It is a risk. We did discuss it before um, when we were coming up with the idea of adding some uh, uh, ship up like uh, unlocks, but we felt it was worth the risk. And uh, what's your favorite uh, legacy ability that, that you can get on a character? Um, oh, I love Darth Vader, so the ability to force choke on any other class is probably pretty cool. I know that um, one of my co-hosts, Anexia, is enamored with the, uh, the purple lightning uh, with her sis, Sith sorcerer. So I'm sure that if, if, uh, if she was enamored with the force choke as much, she'd feel the same way. Um, what type of character do you like to play in game? What's, what's your class and, and spe uh, specialty? I love the Sith warrior because Darth Vader, right? Yeah. <laughs> also like the smuggler. And what sort of activities do you do you like to do? Are you into instance content? Are you a crafter? What do you like to do in game? Um, I really like the level up game um, because you know I'm well. I've been working on single player Bioware games for you know, more than a decade, so I love I love that part of the the game. The uh, just going through the stories um, and leveling up your character. Uh, I like the flashpoints um, just because that's that you know the the really story heavy flashpoints with the group content there. That's that's a lot of fun for me. Um, I love War Zones. Um, I actually didn't think I was going to like War Zones as much as I did, but um, they're, they're a lot of fun, so I like those. Uh, actually, I love almost every aspect of the game, really. Um, so, but if I had to choose, um, I think I'm more of a level-up uh, guy than I am, so I'm, that's one of the reasons I think I'm going to really appreciate the Legacy system, because it is more geared towards people who like to take alts and level them up from 1 to 50. Well, thank you so much for your time, James. Much appreciated. I can't wait for Patch 1.2 to come out on live and, uh, and have fun in the game that you've been working on uh, so hard. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Yep. Well, you didn't want to ask a question about... Uh... Oh, thank you very much. 
one quick thing. Uh, just want to ask about the CG traders before launch. You released those in reverse chronological order, starting with what would chronologically be the last thing that happens. What was the thought process behind releasing them in that order? Well, I could come up with some answer that uh, makes it sound like we had it all planned. But actually, um, what we didn't know how many CG movies we were going to have um, before launch. Um, so we did the first CG movie at kind of a pivotal point um, in the war. And uh, that's the sacking of Coruscant. The problem was, with the sacking of Coruscant after that, it's a Cold War, not much exciting happens. So we're like, well, if we're going to have another movie, we have to go back in time, because we don't want to have a movie where there's no war. We want to have a movie where there is you know, the conflict. So that was the main reason. And then we decided, OK, if we're going to have, at that point, we realized we're going to have two more. So we plan to basically tell the story leading up to the um, sacking of Coruscant. It's actually something really, really cool. I, uh, I, I downloaded them all and put them all into a video editor and, and put them one after the other and put that up on our YouTube channel. It's really interesting to watch it in that direction. Um, probably, I think, you know, discussed amongst uh, our, our hosts on our network and with fans as well, some of the best CG movies uh, that have come out for a game and have really created a lot of excitement. That must, that must feel pretty good to, to put out a movie like that and have so much positive buzz come from it. I agree. It was. I love those movies myself. I'm a giant Star Wars fan, so being able to see um, Blur Studios uh, come up with such high quality uh, movies, I'd love them to do like a, a 120 minute Star Wars uh, CG movie. I think that's been mentioned in a lot of places on the internet. Well, thanks again, James. It was fantastic. Thank you.